Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Cosmetic Corner. My name is Chris Surik, your moderator, and I'm very excited for today's session with Dr. Ted Wojno from Emory. He's a very well-established oculoplastic surgeon who's published in a variety of journals, has spoken all over the world, and is a real expert in the field of oculoplastics. Dr. Wojno, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Today we're here to talk about a very interesting article out of Italy. Dr. Mario Pelle Cervallo talks about transcutaneous brow shaping. Now, I've had the opportunity to watch him present this at a couple of meetings, and it's always interesting to hear the response from the crowd, as it seems like it's somewhat of a controversial topic. Now, to the author's credit, he states that he tried various different blepharoplasty techniques over 30 years of experience, but yet has decided that he feels this is really the best technique in his hands and for his patients, which I find very interesting. He presents us with a study that's a patient uh, review of over a decade of over 200 patients in which he performed direct brow lifting. He goes into some very unique concepts of subtle nuances, both with starting Rogaine prior to the operation, injecting Botox before surgery, and then post-op um, Medoxidil topical management as well. So we're going to dive right in here, doctor. And the first question I have for you is, is, what's your general opinion of the article, and what are your thoughts on direct brow lifting as an operation? Well, the article struck home with me because this is my preferred technique of brow lifting, and I think a lot of this has to do with my training and my age. I'm an ophthalmologist, and I was never trained uh, during residency or fellowship in uh, the endo brow. I had to learn that on my own. Um, but I have found that in my hands this is a very reliable technique and it is my go-to technique for the majority of my patients. That's excellent to hear. Now, um, it's a really nice perspective because we had a commentary uh, that talked about kind of the con to the concept of direct brow lifting. Now, can you comment on kind of your particular method? Do you do the Rogaine preoperatively? Do you do the preop Botox? Tell us a little bit about your approach to direct brow lifting. Well, I thought the concept of using Rogaine preoperatively and Botox is a good idea. I don't routinely do that, but I'm certainly interested in trying that, especially the Rogaine. I have not heard of anybody using Rogaine on the eyebrows, and this makes perfect sense if it is effective to help thicken up the brows a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, Botox, I was actually one of the original investigators in, uh, in the first Botox study that began in 1983. Wow. So I've been using that for a long time and have a lot of patience. Um, and I think the concept of relaxing the tension on the wound with the Botox is a good idea, and I may start to do that too. Um, I think a lot of the other issues that the authors bring up, such as undermining the edges, they consider it to be minimal undermining, but 7 to 10 millimeters of inferior edge undermining, I think is a lot of undermining. And actually, I've been doing that for years and I feel that that has made a big difference in the quality of the scar. Again, by releasing tension on the brow, mm -hmm. they leave a little bit more tissue than I leave uh, in the resection. They mm -hmm. talked about leaving the deep dermis. I usually take the deep dermis, but I always leave the fat underneath. I don't take that either because I think they're correct. Mm -hmm. I found, too, that if I took a lot of that out earlier, I would get more of a depressed scar. Right. So, always leave that. I always close the deep dermis with either interrupted or running uh, polygalactin like they do. And I also use a running horizontal mattress suture on the skin. I think that does a wonderful job of uh, holding the wound together, everting the edges. And I will often leave those stitches in maybe just a hair longer than I would a little the other cutaneous stitches, say seven to eight days instead of five to seven days. So a lot of what they say I've been doing for a long time, and I think they're absolutely correct. You can get a wonderful scar in these patients if you follow a lot of their recommendations. Yeah. I like the idea of not uh, using this in patients with thicker skin. I think they're absolutely correct. 
thicker skin, especially the sebaceous skin with a lot of sebaceous hyperplasia, and also patients with rosacea. I think I have to be very careful with them and their brows. Mm -hmm. And those are the patients that I will usually push towards an endobrow with to avoid the problems with the scar. Mm. But I think they're absolutely right. You can get an almost imperceptible scar if you pick the right patient and do it the right way. That's great. Thank you very much. Do you bevel 30 degrees with an 11 blade? Is that your preferred way to make the incision? I use a 15 blade, not an 11 blade, but okay. yes, I do bevel it. And I've played with all the beveling techniques, and I think I like the technique best that bevels the lower edge and amputates the lashes while leaving the follicles behind. This has been written up, I think, several times in the plastic surgery literature, mm -hmm. and that talks about how at six months to a year down the road, the hair will actually grow right through the scar line right. and camouflage it even further. And that actually does work. So it's Excellent. quite good. <laughs> well, now we're going to shift gears just a little bit. And just for the young plastic surgeon or the resident that might be watching the cosmetic corner with us today, how do you discern when a patient comes in and they say, you know, my eyes are saggy, um, but you try to determine do they need a brow lift, do they need a blepharoplasty, do they need it in combination? What's your personal algorithm um, for us? Well, I think we spend a lot of time, like everybody should, talking with the patient to find out exactly what they want to see when they are healed. Yeah. And of course, as you started to show me, they all come in doing this. Right. I want this gone. I want this gone. <laughs> and does that mean they want their lids? Does that mean they want their brows? Does that mean they want their forehead? Do they want everything? So this is the patient education process where I tell them, now what you've just done actually is not do anything to your eyelids, but you've lifted your brows. Have you thought about <laughs> lifting your brows? That's something you want to see. And then I'll put them in front of the mirror, I'll lift it up, and I'll say, this is what you just showed me. Do you really think that looks good? Is that a way you want to look? And I can't begin to stress the importance when one sees a male patient of clearing this with the wife. <laughs> Some of the unhappiest patients I've had to put up with were not the patients themselves, but the wife of the man who came in and wanted to do this without consulting his wife. No kidding. And it turns out that the wife has a lot to say, a <laughs> lot of good opinions, and I think for the for the the. Uh, the goodwill of, pres of preserving the marriage, the husband should bring in the wife or at least discuss this with the wife before you go forward. <laughs> and that's something I've learned the hard way because I've put up with a lot of angry women who said, you made my husband look too different. The husband was happy, the wife wasn't. All right, sir, one more final question for you. Uh, at the meetings, we hear some speakers espousing that chemical brow lift has really replaced surgical brow lift in their practice or has become a big part of it. Um, in your years of experience, you know, what are your thoughts on this concept and, and what advice could you give us in regards to this? Well, again, I've used Botox more than just about anybody in the world or, or maybe longer than anybody in the world, maybe not more. Uh, surgical brow lifting is far from dead. Uh, I use botulinum toxin, but it is not my go-to. It is temporary. It is often not as reliable as surgery and is only minimally effective for a lot of the patients that I see. Yeah. So I think you choose the surgery that you do based on what's best for the patient and what the patient wants to see or doesn't want to see when you get done with them. Excellent, excellent. Well, I want to thank you for an awesome interview. It was a pleasure visiting with you. I also want to congratulate you. I hear you just had your first grandchild. So that's very exciting. Congratulations. Thank you so much. We enjoy visiting with you. And for those of you who follow Cosmetic Corner, we'll see you next month.